The webinar will begin with uh, the welcome remarks by uh, Dermot McCarthy, Chair of Irish School of Economics Trust Steering Committee, followed by the roundtable panel discussion chaired by Ian Atak, Assistant Professor, Peace Studies School of Religion, Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, as usual, the ISC at 50 webinar panel discussion will be in three rounds. Uh, the first round on um, panel members' views on the topic, focusing on opportunities and challenges. Uh, the second, on how to address and overcome the challenges. And finally, an open discussion where we invite the audience to utilize the chat function to raise comments and questions. Now, over to you. Dermot. Thanks very much, uh, Jane, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, webinar in the series which the Trust has been supporting, ably organised by Jane, to honour the anniversary of the establishment of the Irish School of Ecumenics, uh, and to do it by bringing together people from within the school and the wider community of researchers and activists to discuss and engage with topics which would have been of great interest to Michael Hurley, the, the founding visionary of the school. And I think our program this afternoon and our contributors uh, express the hope of the trust very fully that this would be a series of events that would address important questions and draw on those with particular insight to lead us in reflection and discussion on topics of continuing and arguably growing concern uh, in our time. So I'm very grateful to those who have agreed to contribute as our panelists uh, this afternoon, if I may in particular um, acknowledge my, my old friend and colleague and a good friend of the school, uh, Noel Dorr, and thank him for uh, being part of our, our exercise this afternoon. And to thank Ian for taking on the hopefully not terribly arduous task of steering us uh, through the session ahead. So I'm very happy to hand over to you, Ian, and to welcome again all our participants. Thanks very much, uh, Termas. Um, uh, as Jill mentioned, uh, I'm, my name is Ian Atak, and I teach on the MPhil in International Peace Studies in the School of Religion in Trinity College, Dublin, and I'm very happy to chair this session on Ireland as an island of peace. Um, and just to welcome everyone again to this webinar, which is the fourth in the webinar series celebrating the ISC at 50. So the purpose of today's webinar um, on this topic is to examine the challenges and opportunities confronting the island of Ireland's contributions to peacemaking and peace building uh, internationally based on Ireland's own history of conflict and division and more recent efforts to construct sustainable peace on the island. So to put the Irish, uh, Irish experience in this international context. Uh, we're very fortunate to have five excellent contributors to the webinar this evening who will address this theme from a variety of perspectives. I'll just give a brief introduction now and then a more detailed introduction <clears throat> to each speaker um, before they give their first presentation. So first to speak will be Noel Dorr, former Secretary General of the Department of Foreign Affairs, followed by John McGuire, Professor Emeritus of Sociology, University College Cork, Shona Bell, Program Manager, Sectarianism, Cory Miele Community, David Mitchell, Assistant Professor in Conflict Resolution and Reconciliation, based in Belfast, um, part of the School of Religion, Trinity College, Dublin, and uh, Finally, finally, Lisa Clark, who is co-president of the International Peace Bureau. So as Jim mentioned, the webinar will follow the same format as previous webinars in the series. There will be two rounds of presentations from each of the speakers. The first on the opportunities and challenges 
for Ireland as an island of peace. And the second round on suggestions from each speaker for overcoming challenges to Ireland's contributions as an island of peace. So each presenter will have five to seven minutes for their presentations in each of these rounds. And um, I'm sure they will observe that time limit quite strictly um, so that we will have time for uh, questions and discussion in the final part of the webinar. Um, but I may, if necessary, send a little chat message to them uh, to remind them of, uh, of that uh, time frame. So again, as Jim mentioned, there will be an opportunity for questions to the panel following the two rounds of presentations. Um, but we do ask you to submit your questions uh, and comments using the chat function so that these can be directed to members of the panel following the two rounds of presentations. So um, that's the format of the webinar. Um, we can move on to the first round of presentations. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Noel Dorr. Um, Noel is a retired Irish diplomat. Uh, he was permanent representative of Ireland at the UN from 1980 to 1983, uh, when he was Irish representative in the UN Security Council. Um, and in, from April to May 1981, acted as president of the Security Council. From 1983, to 1987, Noel was the Irish ambassador to the UK. He then served as Secretary General of Ireland's Foreign Ministry from 1987 to 1995. He has written several books based on his experience, including The Search for Peace in Northern Ireland and Sunningdale, published in 2017. Noel is a member of the Royal Irish Academy and has an honorary doctorate from NUI Galway. So we look forward to hearing what you have to say, Noel, on the topic of Ireland as an island of peace. Thank you very much, Ian. As I understand the title, there are two aspects to it. One would be internal, that is to say, is the island at peace? Are we at peace with ourselves on this island? The other aspect is external. Ireland, and here it would probably be the state, uh, as a force for peace in the world. And of course, there's another related point. Is the peace process in Ireland something that other countries might follow or be interested in, in their own problem, dealing with their own problems? I'm going to take a risk in starting with a little bit of history. It's almost inevitable in Irish matters. I'll try to keep it very brief, no more than a minute, because if we're to keep to the time, it's going to be rather difficult. Uh, it seems to me that uh, much of recent history in Ireland has turned on the interaction of two relationships. One is our relationship with the neighbouring island, Great Britain. The other is the relationship between two imagined communities in the island of Ireland. I'm borrowing that word imagined community uh, from the Belfast uh, political scientist, Benedict Anderson. It doesn't mean imaginary. It means the way in which a population or a community uses the word we and our, talking about the narrative of the past, a common narrative and a common future, our forefathers and our children and grandchildren and so on. And that is really at the heart of peace in Ireland. What is the relationship of those two communities and the relationship between the two islands, which is interconnected with it? Now, uh, another point that strikes me as very interesting it's quite remarkable that uh, at the very end of the 18th century, uh, there were two competing agendas put forward for the future of this island. And those agendas in a reduced form are still at play today in Northern Ireland. One was that of Wolf Tone. His aim was to unite Protestant, Catholic and dissenter, all the religious groupings in Ireland in one and in an independent republic. The other, that inspired the 1798 rebellion. The other agenda was that of William Pitt, the British prime minister, two years later, largely in reaction to the rebellion, 
he pushed through a union of the two islands in a single parliament at Westminster. And as I say, those are the two agendas playing out still today in what the Northern Ireland historian A.T.Q. Stewart calls the narrow, narrow ground of Northern Ireland. Now, I skip forward very quickly. The Irish nationalist majority, the Catholics largely, was not finding the union. They were finding it rather a very cold house. And the British government responded at the end of the 19th century over 30 years by trying to put through home rule, which would have given limited autonomy to the whole island within the United Kingdom. That was strongly opposed by unionists and conservatives. And at one stage, just immediately before the first war, you had, we had rather, two large militias in this island, both with arms imported from Germany, both directing their attention to the British government, one, opposing home rule, if necessary, by force. The other, supporting home rule, if necessary, by force. Now, both were directed to the British government, but the potential for civil war in the island is obvious. The Irish nationalists pushed through when home rule failed with a more radical approach, 1916 rebellion and the war of independence. And Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister heading the British government, uh, pushed through the settlement of 1920-21 as a, a way of resolving the Irish problem. This would divide the island and give each of the two elements, unionists in the north and nationalists in the rest of the island, some of what they wanted, but not everything. That settlement was predicated on the idea that there were two parts in the island. But in fact, the way the division took place meant that there were three parts because within Northern Ireland was a very substantial nationalist min minority who felt they were cut off and uh, they were very discontented. And in response, the unionist majority feeling themselves under siege, uh, I'm afraid over a 50 year period of single party government in the devolved assembly and Stormont, the unionist party uh, engaged in a degree of discrimination against the nationalist minority. This whole situation exploded eventually in the, er, in the late 1960s. And the two governments, that is to say the British and the Irish government, reacted in a sort of outdated way. The British government believed that this was all settled in 1920-21 and the Irish government was a foreign government, although a friendly one. And the Irish government believed it was all due to the partition of the island. Fortunately, in the early 70s, as the troubles grew greater, the two governments began to develop a better understanding of what the reality of the problem was. The British government put forward the word Irish dimension, which recognized that there was an internal aspect to the problem, that it wasn't just a claim from what they first saw as a foreign government on territory, but that built into Northern Ireland was this Irish dimension. And the Irish government began to accept grudgingly at first that there could never be unity in Ireland without the consent of a majority in Northern Ireland. The cooperation between the two governments led to three efforts from 1973 to 1998 to resolve the problem. The Sunningdale Conference, 1973, the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985, and of course the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement in 1998. Now those three attempts at a settlement were different, but they had common elements. The first common element was cooperation between the two governments. The second was recognition of the identities of the two communities in Northern Ireland, the two different narratives and so on. The third was consent as a, a, an absolute condition for any change in the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. The fourth was a commitment by the British government that if there were a majority in Northern Ireland in favor of unity, they would legislate for that. And of course there was reform, policing and other human rights issues 
And basically, and very important, the two communities were to have their identities recognized. They could pursue their different agendas, one for unity, one for continuing the union, provided they did so by peaceful means only. So you really had in this, these approaches a deferral to the future of what a final resolution, if any, might be and conditions set for what that would be. And in the meantime, there was cooperation in power sharing in the institutions in Northern Ireland, a link with the South, and of course, the British and Irish governments cooperating to bring all this about as, so to speak, co-guarantors. The first two attempts that I mentioned, the Sunningdale Agreement and the Anglo-Irish Agreement, were eventually superseded by the Good Friday Agreement, as we call it, or the Belfast Agreement, which had many more elements to it. And one of them was a recognition in the agreement that people in Northern Ireland were free to be British or Irish or both as they chose. There were other important elements, but most important now we see was the benign background offered by a common membership of the UK and Ireland in the European Union. And the uh, common, uh, the, the sort of common background provided a benign situation in the island of Ireland. And uh, I think one of the most important things was that the two governments at head of government level, at the very top level, were deeply involved in all three of those efforts that I mentioned, and particularly Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern, the two prime ministers in the final one. Now we're facing today a number of problems about that. I'm going to finish in a moment. One is that I am afraid the prime ministerial attention in the UK is not there anymore. Secondly, Brexit. Thirdly, the protocol, which is much talked about, which was an attempt to remedy the worst effects of Brexit. And most difficult of all is the fact that the cooperation in the institutions, which was to soften the problem in Northern Ireland and defer it for another generation, as we have seen instead a contention between the more radical elements on the two sides, Sinn Féin and the DUP, in what is really a zero-sum game in the Northern Ireland institutions. So this is the question where we go from here. I am uh, much more to say, but I think I'll reserve it for the next round, as also what I might want to say about Ireland in international affairs or the state in international affairs. That's the second aspect of the title. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Joel, for your um insights for, for providing some of the historical and political background to both divisions on the island, um, but also efforts to achieve sustainable peace, and then reminding us, if we need reminding, of some of the current challenges that we face in fulfilling um, those efforts. So I'll now ask John McGuire to uh, speak. Uh, John is Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the at University College Cork. He is also a board member of AFRI or Action from Ireland, an Irish NGO that promotes human rights, peace, justice, and sustainable development with a focus on injustice caused by conflict. He was a lecturer in UCD from 1969 to 1978, a research fellow at Nuffield College at the University of Oxford from 1973 to 1975, and Professor of so Sociology at UCC from 1978 to 1997. Uh, John uh, is also the author of uh, a book called Defending Peace, Ireland's Role in a Changing Europe, published by Cork University Press. So John is well placed to address some of these issues connected to tonight's topic. So over to you, John. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Um, and first of all, thank you to Jean, not only for organizing this, but for organizing me with my, my amateurish slides, which I'll ask him to show at certain points. 
Um, unusually for me, I'll rattle through a prepared text to keep myself to time, so I hope I don't go too quickly. Congratulations and thank you for inviting me to share in your celebrations. I remember Father Michael Hurley affectionately, but could well learn more about him and the work of the school he founded in 1960. A turning point. The Republic was five years into its UN membership. The disastrous border campaign was in mid-course and TK Whitaker's ideas were beginning to transform economic life and policy. Much excellent work, and no one has talked about it, followed in pursuit of peace. Along with modest but effective UN initiatives on disarmament and elsewhere, Ireland's citizens and its soldiers embarked on a proud record of UN-led peacekeeping. Though the border campaign ended in 62, our divided island's unresolved conflicts reignited dreadfully by the decade's end. Heroic patience and hope over the next decades built the peace process and the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Were we? Are we now on an island of peace? Can peace be an island, literally or metaphorically? And what of the ocean surrounding it? Has the ice age of the Cold War been succeeded by global warming in the so-called War on Terror? Uh, slide one, please. On one narrative of the past six decades, we have maintained our values, sensibly restating them in a world of new challenges and resources. Another narrative sees us as trimming rather than creatively restating those values and policies. Slide two, please. On that narrative, we're actually helping to fashion the altered and dangerous world to which we claim merely to be responding. I've contributed to this narrative in Defending Peace in 2002, slide three, please, and more recently in my contribution to the People's Movement publication on PESCO. Your invitation is most welcome, but I've rarely agonized so much before any presentation and never so clearly faced the question that dogs me now. Is there any real point in anything I say? My agonizing personally is a matter for me and my friends, God help them, but here it exemplifies a more general experience bordering on political abuse. Joe Higgins TD once compared criticizing former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern to playing handball against a haystack. Every ball disappeared, none ever came back. And slide four, please. This brings to mind Mr. Hearn's promise not to enlist us in NATO's Orwellian partnership for peace without a referendum, a promise made in opposition blithely ignored in government. This went along with acquiescence in NATO's illegal war in Serbia, Kosovo, and the illegal second Iraq war. There have been more than 3.5 million troop movements along with torture related CIA stopovers, slide five please, through Shannon, all stubbornly uninspected for often illegal and always catastrophic conflicts. I and others relate these developments to NATO's undermining and usurpation of, rather than working to reaffirm the UN's authority and values. We discern a parallel militarization of the EU and of Ireland's defense policy in furtive lockstep. Slide six, please. We might of course be mistaken, but under article six of our constitution, we have a right, indeed a legal and moral duty to be engaged in democratic deliberation. Instead, we meet denials that anything significant is happening at any stage. This creates a new normal for the following step, which will in its turn be distorted or denied. Our referendum commission no longer clarifies the pros and cons for the sovereign people, but makes ex cathedra statements of the facts. Uh, slide seven, please. This travesty is overseen by a judiciary which misrepresents Article 29 of our constitution as merely advisory and refuses to confront the executive on foreign policy. When all this fails, we have the cancellation of two legally binding referendum decisions on Nice and Lisbon when the sovereign people give the wrong answer. I laugh that I may not weep. Heartbreak is never far away. I have sadly to question how consistent all this is with an island of peace, and particularly whether in the Republic we now have anything like a genuine round table on issues of peace and war. Your format at this round table kindly offers me a second go to consider the prospects for reconnecting our policies and practices with our values and commitments. For the moment, with apologies, I won't prolong the recital of the narrative of mili uh, militarization. Someone, not Einstein, 
defined insanity as persistently doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. Rather than further pursuing the second narrative here, I'll focus on the reasons why it has gained so little purchase. It's rhetorically satisfying to see the changes in our military policy as being led by a diabolical cohort of pugnacious politicians and militaristic mandarins. But maybe the reality is more complex, more mundane, and ultimately more disturbing, which takes us straight back to our historical starting point. On New Year's Eve 1959, the very last day of the famously troubled 1950s, Dr. T.K. Whitaker wrote to his opposite number in Industry and Commerce about how to shift Ireland's economy from protection to foreign investment and trade. Slide eight, please. There can be no doubt, he wrote, that an externally applied discipline will arouse less opposition, appear less discriminatory, and be more effective than a system operated entirely at the discretion of the domestic administration. So one of the key architects of the new order believed that the way out of social and economic stalemate at home was a multinational merger. How did his generation of leaders function in their new role as branch managers? And how much of head office's business plan did they take on board? We now have our prime suspect, Dr. Whitaker in the secretary's office with a fountain pen. Join us again in part two. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, John, for uh, those um, uh, identifying some of those challenges and of course linking the domestic policies of the Republic of Ireland to some of these issues in international politics um, and raising important issues such as um, whether or not there is complicity in war and challenges to the republics of the republic's uh, self-professed neutrality through the use of Shannon Airport by um, by uh, military aircraft on their way to wars in the Middle East. So some challenging ideas there indeed. So I'll now um, ask Shona Bell to speak. Shona is the programme manager, uh, sectarianism for the Cory Mila community in Northern Ireland. She has worked in the field of peace and reconciliation for more than 20 years. Shona initially qualified as a teacher in Scotland in the 1990s and came to Northern Ireland to work in the field of education for Cory Mila community in, uh, uh, in the 1990s. In 2003, Shona joined Tides Training and Consultancy and supported a range of key developments and training packages um, supporting the unfolding peace process in Northern Ireland. In 2014, she returned to Corrymeela, holding a number of key positions in relation to the strategic development of the organization. So over to you, Shona. Um. It is really good to see you all. Good afternoon. My name is Shona Bell and I'm the manager of sectarianism at the Corrymeela community. But just let me confirm, I do not organise sectarianism <laughs> or cause it, or I hope so, I hope not, just to be clear. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and I'd like to thank my friend and colleague Jin for inviting me and congratulations to the ISE. Having been a peace practitioner in Northern Ireland for the past 20 years, working directly with fragile communities and with community groups who come to our centre, I'd like to speak to you from a place of deep experiential knowledge and hopefully some wisdom in there somewhere. I admire and respect knowledge that comes out of scholarly and policy driven research, but I also recognise the knowledge that's grounded in everyday realities of the people who bear the continued brunt of partially realised peace accords. Cormula predates the Troubles, as many of you will know, and indeed developed as a result of the vision of Ray Davey, uh, subsequent to his experiences in World War II. He was no stranger to what people were willing to do to one another, having experienced the aftermath of the Allied bombing of Dresden. Cormula has experienced multiple iterations of practice, but at its heart, it is a recognition that when relationships are established, new ways of being and new patterns of trust can develop. And this at our heart is the basis of an island of peace. 
I see seven iterations of development that the work of Corey Mila and my own work has gone through over this time. Um, and it shines a little bit of light on my, my thinking. Because at first, as the violence developed, particularly in dense urban areas, Corey Mila became a place of respite, a place where people could come away to exhale, where they'd feel welcomed, supported, um, it was important to, in our efforts to create and establish and hold a place or a space that felt safe, where people's fears could settle, where the human instinct to fight or flee was reduced, where they could just be without threat. Um, these were really wild times with stories of crisis response, busloads of children and sardine sleeping. Um, it was purposeful. It was immediate and it was inspirational. And in some ways and in reflection, I think Corimila in its 50 years have mourned that time where we were all focused on the most basic of human needs, which was sitting in front of us, which was human security and safety. So step one was creating spaces that are hospitable, welcoming, nurturing and establishing safety. After a focus on respite, there was a recognition um, that uh, the trust built over the years was an opportunity to go further, to take the next step. And so during this era, era, we began to build relationships across divides. As a result, cross-community contact became a significant part of our work. And my initial role in Coramula back in the 90s was both as a volunteer first and then as a community relations education worker. And we intentionally brought people together, children, communities, schools, churches, youth groups from different sides of Northern Ireland or the North of Ireland's conflicts. I wonder how many on this call probably have a story of a trip to Corimila, and uh, we have lots of people that tell us about wooden beds and drafty halls. I have to say it's not like that now, um, but step two was very much the invitation to encourage and convene cross-group gatherings and to begin to build trust and relationships um, across divides. It didn't take long to understand that cross-community contact, especially in such a beautiful and nurturing environment as the centre, can bring forward a real mountaintop experience. But there was an, an inevitable downside. Those powerful and emotional accomplishments were quickly destabilised by a return to real life. Returning home, children were reminded of the exceptionality of these positive cross-group experiences. Sometimes the experience lingered as a question mark in the head of the individual, but it was never going to be enough to counter the sectarian powerhouse which had been created and sustained within their community. Step three in, in my experience of these developments has, to been, has been to recognise the possibilities, but also the limitations of contact. Corimula continued to reflect and to learn, and we revisited our beliefs about change and decided that we needed now to influence leaders. <laughs> In other words, we decided that it was important not just to pull people out of fragile settings, but we needed to empower influential people who lived inside those communities. This led us in the early 2000s, just after our peace agreement, to place value and prioritise civic empowerment and the development of teacher training resources were developed and training was put in place. And this, we thought, would lead to a seeding of reconciliation in the wider organisations of our society. So step four for me would be building capacity and in influential, uh, in influential leaders and agents of change. However, we quickly realised that a training course and developing resources were never going to be enough to build the capacity of the individual because they were embedded in really strong, historic and problematic systems and structures. So the structural violence became more and more evident. By 2015, we were addressing structural issues around resid residual violence trapped between and beyond statutory agencies and to tackle uh, systems and structures that uphold, perpetuate or the root causes of violence. More recently, we're spearheading supporting research, which is step six. And then after a recent wave of escalated sectarian tension, I find myself back hosting people who are exhausted because they're frontline workers in Northern Ireland or the Northern Ireland of Ireland during a time of deep division. All to say the road to an island of peace with itself and others is the work of many and the arc is a long one. There are narratives of brokenness throughout our communities and unless we continue to pursue the work of peace the unravelling that we saw on the interfaces at Easter this year will continue. This is what we know. Working at the individual level is really, really important, but it's not enough. Working at the community level is really important, but it's not enough. 
working at the leadership level is really important, but it's not enough. Working at the policy and structural level is important, but not enough. Working at the formal governmental level is important, but it's not enough. What is enough? So step seven, deep transformational change requires working together, something that is very difficult for us on this island. It also requires courage because the foes of peace are fierce and they are active. The most important thing is that we remain persistent in the face of disillusionment because the future of our children depends on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shona, for sharing your experience and um, the experience of Corey Mila and those insights into practical peacemaking based on that experience over many years of engagement. So thanks very much for that. Um, I'll now turn to David Mitchell, who is Assistant Professor in Conflict Resolution and Reconciliation in the School of Religion, Trinity College Dublin, uh, based in Belfast. David's main research interest is in peace building and the politics of peace processes, uh, with a specialism in Northern Ireland. He has published research in leading international journals on several dimensions of the Northern Ireland transition, including party politics, language, sport, mediation, and religion. His current research focus is on the comparative meaning and value of the Northern Ireland experience. Uh, and he speaks frequently to international groups of policymakers and civil society organizations um, to share this experience. So over to you, David. Thanks very much, Ian. And it's great to be part of this event. Um, yeah, so as, as, as the little uh, intro says, I've been interested in this topic for the last few years, um, particularly how the Northern Ireland peace process is, is viewed outside of Ireland, what, what the sort of uh, comparative value is of the peace process um, here, and this whole subject of what might be called the lessons of the, the Northern Ireland peace process. And there's no doubt that the relative success of the, the peace process has contributed to this image of the island of peace and the notion that other conflict affected societies should be trying to, to learn from Ireland. But of course, behind that image, um, there's a lot to unpack and investigate. When I was thinking about what to say today, um, I was reminded of an experience I had about 10 years ago when I took my car in uh, for its MOT test on the Boucher Road. <laughs> and it was during the summer uh, when there'd been some street violence surrounding the, the marching season. And I was in the little waiting area and I got chatting to the guy beside me and it turned out he was a Kurd from Iraq uh, who had been living in Belfast for a few years. Now my impression of Iraq was that it was a, just an utter wasteland of, of violence and devastation. Um, and I kind of said to him sympathet sympathetically, you know, how's things in Iraq? Um, and the man said, oh, great, much more peaceful than Belfast. Um, now, he was serious, but he had a slight smile on his face. Um, so I think he knew that he was sort of playing with our impressions of each other's country. But it was a good reminder that um, images of peace and conflict are, are complex, they're, they're relative, and they don't always fit with other people's ex experience of peace and conflict in their everyday lives. And of course, there are many people uh, in the North uh, who have continued to suffer from patterns of conflict since 1998, who would not recognize the image of Ireland as a, an island of peace. But it's not all about um, impressions and subjectivity, because we can objectively say that the Northern Ireland peace process is a successful one in that a comprehensive settlement was reached, and it is still mostly in place 23 years later. Many conflict affected societies would love to be in that position. Um, in 2018, um, Jin and I attended the conference at Queen's University to mark the um, 20th anniversary of the agreement when there was this huge range of political leaders on stage, including uh, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, and Bertie Ahern. 
Uh, and there was a bit of cynicism around that event because there wasn't actually a functioning government at that time. And the agreement uh, actually looked in some jeopardy. But of course, Jin saw all this with a Korean perspective. Um, and he said to me during the event, how envious he was that we had a peace process where this was possible, where you could have former enemies on a stage looking back at a political agreement having been made rather than looking forward, hopefully, for one. So the very fact that a negotiated settlement was attained in what was thought to be a hopeless situation could be a symbol of hope for other conflicts. Perhaps we could even call it a lesson. But beyond that, there are many problems with the idea of Northern Ireland as a model. Some might say that there are all kinds of uh, procedural or technical lessons from Northern Ireland, such as how negotiations were organized, how independent commissions were used, how elections and referendums were used, how disarmament and police reform happened. But all of those techniques only worked because of the, the underlying circumstances and the fact that the parties were willing to allow them to work. So they can't be exported just because they look like they were effective in Ireland. Some might say that Northern Ireland shows the need for balanced compromise in order to settle conflicts. But that may or may not be true. Some conflicts are asymmetric. In other words, one side has more power than the other. So in those places, uh, a just and fair settlement would actually be an unbalanced compromise. So Northern Ireland might be an inappropriate template for that. Some might say Northern Ireland shows that governments need to talk to militants without preconditions. But there aren't any clear lessons here either, since in Northern Ireland, militants were willing to talk. There were some preconditions and the state used, um, continued to use hard power and traditional security alongside diplomacy. Maybe the biggest single factor in the Irish peace process was the cooperation of London and Dublin and how the UK and Ireland realized they had a shared interest in trying to solve the problem. But again, this isn't really repeatable elsewhere. And in many other places, the key actors just don't see such a shared interest. They benefit from the conflict status quo. So there might not be a lesson there either. So to finish this first little contribution, um, the image of Northern Ireland as an exemplary peace process um, that people should learn from is easy to dismantle. But nevertheless, I don't think that's the end of the story. I think there is still some value in this image of the island of peace and people learning about Northern Ireland. Uh, and that's what I'll come back to in the next bit. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, David. Um... Again, for those insights based on your own experience and your research into um, the impact of the, the peace process in Northern Ireland and raising those questions about the, um, the, the lessons that may or may not be learned from our experience on this island. So our final um, speaker for this round uh, is Lisa Clark. And Lisa is co-president of the International Peace Bureau and has been since 2016. As co-president of the IPB, Lisa represents the Nobel Peace Laureate, this Nobel Peace Laureate organization within the Permanent Secretariat and at the summits of Nobel Laureates. Lisa has also lived in Sarajevo under siege in the early, 90, early to mid 1990s and then spent long periods in other, par other areas of Bosnia and in Kosovo supporting nonviolent groups. She later participated in human rights and election monitoring missions in Palestine, Albania and Chappas and coordinated the civil society monitoring mission for the first democratic elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2006. Uh, in 2007, 2008, she coordinated the Italian campaign for, for a future without nuclear weapons. She has been an active member of the international campaign to abolish 
nuclear weapons, uh, which also won the Nobel Peace Prize in Italy, as well as Blessed Are the Peacemakers. So speaking to us from Padova in Italy, um, uh, over to you, Lisa. Oh, I think you're on mute. But I can't get it undone. There we are. I'm terribly sorry about this. Um, I'm also the only really non, totally non-academic, and so I'm always um, slightly intimidated by all new professorial types. Um, this is in awe, actually, of all your work as well, primarily. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that I learnt a little bit about the um, about the Irish School of Ecumenics only after receiving your invitation, and I am absolutely thrilled and want to learn more about it. And uh, it sort of dawned on me that Father Michael Hurley, who must have been absolutely great and a visionary, would have being so excited to be alive at the time of Pope Francis. I think, uh, I think the two of them were sort of, must have been kindred spirits in a sense. Um, the encyclical Fratres Omnis, All Brothers, has meant so much to us, uh, certainly in Southern Europe. It, it, it has meant a lot. It's the only real peace politics that we see around these days. But, in any case, I cannot talk about Ireland. Uh, you realize that Ireland to me is somewhere that I've been for less than one day once. I arrived on a peace boat in Dublin and spent one day there and left by plane in the evening. But I have no doubt that some of the things, some of the experiences that I've had in peace and nonviolent activism have a sort of more general connotation that can be perhaps of interest in some details uh, also to also to this um, to, to my co-panelists and the audience. Uh, I, uh, I was very interested in what Shona had to say when Shona said the work of many is what is needed. I had written as part of uh, my concluding uh, sentence, I had said we have there are so many different levels of action and engagement for peace and reconciliation. Each one of those levels is important. Each one of those levels is essential. We were uh, small at a small level in Bosnia. I will go, I will go to Bosnia because Bosnia was my, my academic training, my non-academic peace training was actually in, in the field. Uh, Sarajevo under siege, and then immediately after the Dayton agreements. Uh, I, I lived in Sarajevo when it was being bombed. I lived there amidst, amongst the people and saw that actually during the worst violence, there was a spirit of solidarity that was spontaneous amongst the people. But of course, they were the people of one side. And then the minute the date and the cords were signed, we as foreign, I, I was a foreigner, but there were lots of us of the Blessed Are the Peacemakers volunteers, we realized that we were in a position to be useful to cross the former front lines, because even though the tanks had been removed, those front lines remained symbolically dangerous, uncrossable, and uh, it, 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 they, they were no longer, they were no longer possible for the people. And we had met during the period of the actual fighting, many people who had relatives and families on the other side, as you know, Bosnia, I imagine that uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, this is uh, very similar. But in, in Bosnia, there were people who were divided by the war in, in, in their families, or even just old friends. And so one of the first things we did was set up a, uh, a little minibus uh, service to cross the former front lines because uh, in, in the company of other people, people became brave enough to do so. And our first, one of our first trips was absolutely wonderful was the uh, grandparents going over to meet their grandchildren who had been born during the war. They had never met them before and we drove them there. Anyway, this is the kind of peace activism and nonviolent activism 
that is as important as the stuff higher up. I think Shona probably agrees with me on that. The other aspect that of course came across quite clearly was what's the difference between negative peace and positive peace, as Galtung tells us in, uh, in, in books that we read, but uh, the Dayton Accord was the most negative of negative pieces possible. And in fact, uh, just a few years later, the power had all gone back to the nationalists, into the hands of the nationalists. Um, schools, for example, uh, they were, since they had been divided along ethnic lines and the power had been divided along ethnic lines, each group wrote their own history books. So we had children going to school, even on the side of the Croat Muslim Federation, where the history books for the Croat children, uh, Bosnian Croat children, were different from the history books of the Bosniak, the Bosnian Muslim children. And eventually this led to having separate classrooms, obviously. So this is so important, the idea, yes, okay, one more minute, getting there. Uh, the, the idea that we can, um, that we should take into consideration how we build things together, not just how we repress the violence, but Dayton was just that. It was just dividing the warring parties and that's all. And I'm afraid that that is what usually happens in the world of officialdom uh, and peace treaties, unless we have all the different levels included. And here I go back to what Shona said, the work of many is what really counts. Uh, and the other thing that I think counts on our part is that we must never give up. We must be persistent. And even if it doesn't work while we're doing it, it's always worthwhile, whatever, uh, hand we extend in friendship will eventually get the message across that there are other human beings out there who are are not out to kill you and uh i i think that we have a lot to contribute from that point of view thanks thanks very much lisa uh, for bringing in your that dimension based on your experience with practical peacemaking and activism in Bosnia and uh, reiterating that point about the importance of persistence, of course, uh, but also multiple levels of engagement um, when it comes to moving from negative peace to a more positive peace. So thanks for that. So we'll begin now uh, with the second round of presentations. And this is an opportunity for our speakers to, um, to uh, comment or uh, make suggestions on how we might overcome some of the challenges that have been identified um, in the first round presentations. So overcoming the challenges to uh, Ireland as an island of peace. So beginning with you, Noel. I'll speak first something about the problem in this island, in Northern Ireland, but then I'll talk a little bit about the international aspect. I think uh, a kind of motto I have in my mind is that we could have unity in Ireland only if we could have amity in Northern Ireland and if Northern Ireland worked. Uh, you know that our constitution was amended following the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement. And it says now in Article 3, it is the firm will of the Irish nation in harmony and friendship to unite all the people who share the territory of the island of Ireland. I put the stress on those words in harmony and friendship. And another aspect of the Good Friday Agreement, which differed from previous efforts at a settlement, was that it provided that there would have to be simultaneous decision north and south before there could be unity. Previously, the focus was all on consent of a majority in Northern Ireland. There was a sort of assumption that the rest of the island wanted unity, but now it has to be explicit. 
although the detail in the Good Friday Agreement is very sparse, it's clear that you would have two parallel referenda, an idea originally put forward by John Hume. So it is not simply a matter of the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland deciding that there should be a referendum in Northern Ireland if he thinks a majority would want unity. It would now have to be paralleled with the referendum in this part of the island. And that, of course, would presuppose a great deal of discussion and uh, sort of uh, a planning here before anything could be done. I think uh, what we need to realize in this part of the island is that if there were to do, be a united Ireland, it would be a hugely changed Ireland. So the, the issue is an existential one. This state, which has grown up and built itself with a certain ethos, certain attitudes, certain assumptions, would have to make major revisions, however that unity was to take place. Uh, the thing we would not want is a united Ireland with a, which unionists in Northern Ireland felt to be a cold house for them. We've had too much of that. We had the Irish nationalist majority in the 19th century felt the union with the UK was a cold house. I, the Irish state offered a fairly cold house as they saw it to unionists over 50 years since Northern Ireland was established. And the unionists in Northern Ireland, when they were a majority, certainly offered a cold house to the nationalist minority. So we must ensure if ever there is to be a united Ireland that we do not repeat that idea of a cold house. It has to be, as the constitution now says, in harmony and friendship. Now, just a couple of points more on that, and then I'll talk about the international situation briefly if I have time. I think a border poll is premature. The call for a border poll has been sparked largely nowadays by Brexit and the consequences of Brexit. And it's been promoted particularly by Sinn Féin. I sometimes wonder if they want a border poll or if they want to appear to want a border poll. In any event, I think it's very important that we take heed of Seamus Mallon, a very important figure uh, on behalf of nationalists in Northern Ireland over the 30 years of conflict. In a book recently, about two years ago, he put forward the idea that a, single, a simple uh, majority in Northern Ireland would not be adequate for Irish unity. And he talked about parallel consent between the two communities uh, so that there would have to be something more. Uh, there would have to be the kind of consent that is uh, it, uh, envisaged in the Good Friday Agreement for our proposals within the Assembly in Northern Ireland. That is either uh, consent of something like 60% or the two uh, communities or the two representatives identifying themselves respectively as nationalist and unionist. There has to be a majority of both. That was his idea. Now that would be difficult for nationalists in Northern Ireland to accept. But it seems to me that to have a border poll now would be premature and to imagine that if there were a simple majority of 50% plus one in favor of Irish unity, that it could happen in harmony and friendship as the constitution demands is simply not very likely. So we need, if we are to ever have unity in Ireland, in the South, to realize that we would have to recast the institutions of the state so it's an existential issue for us in a way that it isn't for the UK. The UK would lose Northern Ireland, but we in this state would have to recast our whole institutions. What I would think if there were to be a border poll, what there should be then is a period of maybe 10, 15 or 20 years after that to come to terms with what had to be done, to work out a new approach, to bring everybody into dialogue and to decide on the shape of the future. I won't labor that point. I want to get on quickly to international affairs. Uh, John McGuire has given a very particular view 
of uh, the is issue as, this, as far as this state goes. I would just point out to him that the Irish Constitution, Article 29, subparagraph 4, subparagraph 9, now reads, the state shall not adopt a decision taken by the Euro European Council to establish a common defence where that common defence would include the state. In other words, we now have written into our constitution a prohibition on the Irish state taking part in a common European defence. Let me be quite clear, I think, I do not think Ireland should join NATO. I think NATO, which was formed as perhaps an understandable defence alliance, particularly understandable for states who had been overrun by Nazi Germany in Europe, that seems to now have turned into a kind of international posse to be used in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So I have no ambition to see Ireland join in that sort of thing. I think John also perhaps overlooks the fact that neutrality was defined and spelled out in the Hague Convention of 1907, but that since then we have had the League of Nations and the United Nations, and the Charter of the United Nations commits us to uh, accept and carry out the, the decisions of the Security Council. And one of the decisions, by the way, uh, in 2003, after the Iraq war, was to authorize a force, a multinational force in Iraq, led by the United States. So there was a period when we were bound by Security Council decision to facilitate uh, perhaps troops passing through Shannon. I don't want to go on too much about that argument. Let me just say that uh, I am perhaps prejudiced because I was involved in my career in uh, Irish foreign policy as an official and diplomat. But I think there's a lot to be said in its favor. I think that Ireland has been elected to the UN Security Council uh, on, uh, four, on four occasions. The first was agreed, no contest. The other three, we were elected on the first count. And uh, as I'm afraid Ian will be aware, in the last election, a short time ago, we beat Canada. In the previous election, we beat Italy. Uh, the one before that, Malta. So it does seem as if internationally, we are reasonably well regarded. Uh, the, there's a lot to be said for what Ireland has done in international affairs to promote peace, which is the title of this uh, seminar. Uh, particularly in UN peacekeeping, I think we have a proud record. We have a small army, probably the size that one would have in any completely disarmed world, you'd still need 15 or 20,000, something of that kind for um, aid to the civil power and various other duties. And ours, our army is about 9,000 at the moment. Uh, we have, the, to our credit, the non-proliferation treaty proposal of Frank Aiken in the 1950s, which led, after much opposition by the major powers, to the negotiation of the Treaty on non Nuclear Non-Proliferation. And in very recent times, we have a great deal to talk about also. I'll just give you some examples. Um, can, no, yes, no. can I just finish in 30 I'd seconds? you to bring your presentation to a conclusion, so we have some time for questions. Can I have 30 seconds to just give a list? Yeah. The Convention on Cluster Munitions was agreed at a conference in Dublin in 2008, chaired by an Irish diplomat. The Landmines Convention, uh, we were part of the core group that drafted the Anti-Personnel land, Landline Convention. Irish Aid has given 25 million to demining projects since 2000. And this is, Put to use in Afghanistan, Angola, Cambodia, Colombia, so on. And we've also funded the International Trust Fund for Demining and Victim Assistance. I won't go on a bit. We're on the Security Council now. We're trying to play our part there to promote peace, and I hope we are doing so. Sorry, Anne, I end, but I thought I had to finish just that list. Thanks very much, Noel, um, both for your insights into the conditions for Irish unity, um, building on some of the requirements of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and also reminding us of uh, some of Ireland's positive 
contributions uh, through the UN and um, in the international sphere. So thanks for that. So John, um, John McGuire, um, over to you for uh, overcoming challenges. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, I had been planning to go through a text and I'll hit some of the main points of it, but it already a bit of discussion between us uh, has started. I'll try to uh, cover some of the points that Noel has raised there. Uh, but I, I think I've certainly looked at a number of challenges uh, and I wonder how uh, we can begin to overcome them. I think there has been a denial um, of uh, our involvement in the business of warfare. Uh, in fact, uh, in both parts of the island. Uh, and it's all right to say we don't want to join NATO, but we were shunted into NATO's partnership for peace. Uh, and if you look at, for example, um, slide 10, uh, our green paper on defense in 2013 uh, describes NATO, uh, refers to NATO. This is our defense forces and Department of Defense referring to NATO as the international standard for military matters and talking about how many neutral countries have adopted it. So I think we have moved implicitly very, very close to NATO and we're in the partnership for peace. Uh, in a certain sense, I don't think we need to join NATO uh, to be involved in the kind of things they're doing, which we are. Um, I think uh, certainly I hugely revere the work of the United Nations, uh, but I'm reminded of uh, uh, Mr. Smith when he was Minister for Defence a good number of years ago, uh, apologising that we hadn't got uh, enough forces for certain UN peacekeeping, particularly as we needed 800 troops to be ready for an EU rapid reaction force. Uh, so I think that our, uh, 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 as it were, playing down and never facing off the ways in which we have drifted into the business of war uh, has been uh, extremely sad. Um, and I was talking about Dr. Whitaker. Let's go back to his desk in January 1962, uh, when Ireland has first applied to join the EEC. This is slide nine. Uh, and there he's writing, uh, Dr. Whitaker is writing to his own minister, we should not ourselves raise obstacles to our being admitted as members of the EEC. To say that we would withdraw our application if membership of NATO were insisted upon would be extremely unfortunate. Uh, so it, it seems clear that uh, from the beginning, our uh, stance on foreign affairs, uh, and it is often summed up under the umbrella phrase neutrality, uh, that stance was not to get in the way of the externally uh, applied discipline uh, that Dr. Whitaker thought we needed and uh, uh, in fact pursued. Um, unfortunately, because I think we have pursued these matters with in a sense our eye off the ball, seeing the military involvement as a sub-question, a tacit involvement uh, following from uh, EU integration, we have now come to a point where the process of drift has recently and abruptly mutated. Noel and many others, including me, may not want to join NATO, uh, but we now have many of our military themselves saying we have to increase our cooperation with NATO, which they see as our sophisticated uh, security partners. So I think we're a lot more involved uh, than merely not wanting uh, to join it. Uh, not only that, but we now have an increasingly articulate and politicized military. Legitimate questions of pay and conditions are now intertwined with an impatience, at times openly contemptuous, to embrace the doctrines and the weapons of our sophisticated security partners. And indeed, uh, our uh, military and many of our uh, economic policy makers, if we go to uh, slide 11, are keen not only to wield, but also to be involved in producing the sophisticated weaponry involved. This, I, you know, is, is this tendency, this readiness 
to embrace many elements of the military industrial complex, a homegrown version, seems to be operating indeed on an all island basis, uh, as we see with the arrival of the Spirit Drone Factory in Belfast. That's very hard to reconcile with the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, particularly the Declaration of Support, which says, like Article 29, that peaceful conflict resolution is the only way to go. Why we are thinking of buying, may already have bought, in fact, a multi-role vessel designed for force projection abroad, not for anything like fishery protection, is very hard to reconcile uh, with. Uh, Article 29, the main points of Article 29, as distinct from the later uh, um, additions, uh, and it's extremely hard to reconcile with the uh, uh, Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Over the past two decades, a significant number of peaceful act activists have been prosecuted for trying to show us who and what we are over Shannon. But whenever there was a jury, in the cold, clear light of the courtroom, their fellow citizens have seen their actions for what they were and acquitted them. The juries made the connections. They gave us grounds for hope. This, of course, happened also in Derry over Raytheon, and most recently here with Colm Roddy and Dave Donnellan. But I don't think I and others are entitled to rely on the persistence and courage of such activists and the clarity and honesty of those juries. Mustn't they evoke a much wider reclaiming of radical citizenship? Now, in our discussion, I can mention some of the many organizations and campaigns already toiling in the vineyard for peace. I hope that I've so far added a slightly unusual piece to the jigsaw an attempt to characterize a mindset that has accepted militarization with NATO, whatever about being in NATO, as a tacit condition of our engagement with the EU. The persistence of campaigners, the courage of peaceful activists, and the generous work of NGOs and charities can flourish fully if and only if we as citizens of Ireland and as citizens of the world living in Ireland reclaim the radical commitment to peaceful citizenship uh, contained in Articles 6 and 29. And I don't think you need to take, finally, you don't need to take my word for that. There's an increasing awareness among the NGOs and charity section sector that they are spending far too much of their energy trying to clear up after catastrophes and conflicts that should have been prevented rather than sanitized. Much great work is being done. I think it's being endangered and I think it's being uh, called in question tragically by our involvement with the authors of the war on terror and the ways in which we have not wanted to face that reality. Thank you. Thanks very much, John, again, for uh, reiterating um, some of those uh, serious challenges to Irish foreign policy uh, and the implications for both the Republic and Northern Ireland in terms of the dangers of the militarization of foreign policy uh, and of international politics. and reminding us again of the important role that NGOs and civil society groups, and indeed ourselves as citizens, have to play in responding to those challenges. So I'll now ask Shona to um, talk about overcoming challenges. Thanks, Shona. And just to remind everyone to put any questions or comments into the chat box. I see some are beginning to appear for our discussion at the end of this round. Over to you, Shona. Thanks very much. Um, 
gosh, there's some links coming up, which is nice, nice to see. So that's exciting. Um, just as COVID hit, so in March 2019, we were just concluding a really critical piece of research uh, that had come out of a partnership between ourselves and the Education Authority and researchers from the Ulster University. And it was called Countering Paramilitary and Organised Criminal Influence on Youth. We were so excited to share this evidence base with the wider community and the findings were rich and relevant and timely, or so we thought. However, instead of all the bells and whistles that we had ex been excited about, it ended up being one of the last events to be hosted by the university. All eyes and attention had shifted. And then, as you know well, we all said goodbye to our lives as we had known them. Um, Corey Mila did what it has always done. Uh, we took stock, we pivoted, and we began to draw on one of the strongest assets and resources that we have, which is the wide global uh, network uh, that we've developed over the 50 years of our um, of our existence. In partnership with the Mershon Centre for the International Security Studies at Ohio State, we started to imagine a different sort of gathering, one that would move beyond the shores of this island. We realised that while our research findings on paramilitarism in Northern Ireland were significant to us, there were case studies sprinkled across the world, scholars, practitioners, policy framers, who were also wrestling with similar issues. Um, it was then that we made the decision to focus on convening a learning platform upon which knowledge could be shared and further developed. And we launched in the autumn of 2021 by bringing together a cross-sectoral and interdisciplinary mix of scholars, government leaders, community activists to wrestle together around several themes relating to transition. They came from Yemen, Rwanda, Colombia, Sweden, South Korea and elsewhere. We titled this learning platform Transitions Moving from Violence to Peace. And as we commence, the overriding question in my own head is, what are we missing and why can't we move? And what is keeping us so stuck? Um, so international voices have always been important to Corimula. And then some would say we're better known abroad than we are here. But I don't think we realised quite the importance of listening, or as certainly I didn't. Northern Ireland or the north of Ireland and Corimula more specifically has much to offer, but we have much to learn. I'm now convinced of the need to stay humble and teachable in the midst of this work and also in the midst of that sort of heavy disillusionment of, wow, are we still here? I'm also convinced that multiple lenses and perspectives and external eyes, if you like, enrich and demand more complex thinking. And these com conversations also really poke at unexamined assumptions that we hold, truths that really aren't true. Um, but rather attitudes and beliefs that we shape through cultural understanding of conflict. We need outside voices, we need to be pushed into spaces of discomfort, we need to question, wonder, wander around this analysis uh, of what we believe to be true. And I believe that whilst dynamics happening in other contexts may not be exactly the same, learning about how others are wrestling with peace are certainly generating creativity in our thinking. So through our discussions, um, we located nine significant themes impacting on transition. Uh, there was reintegration or integration, and this is particularly in relation to ex-combatants um, and moving populations. Number two was relationships, trust and credibility. Number three, identity and labels. Number four was ritual and symbols and how they're often manipulated by those in power. Um, number five was social location. Number six, history. Number seven, measurement and evaluation. Number eight, gender. And number nine, terminology and the use of language. And I'm, I, I do realise that's a long list and highly forgettable. <laughs> but it's a, you can get it from our website. It's a really interesting list of, of transitional points. These nine were not exhaustive, but they simply highlighted the research and discussions around which the platform engaged. I believe two of these priorities in particular are significant to the challenges we face in the late stages of our own peace process. All nine are important, but we don't have all night. <laughs> so the ones I will note here are reintegration and ritual. Reintegration is key because way after 20 years of the peace process, we still maintained armed and unarmed paramilitary groupings. They come in multiple categories. Uh, some are in name only representing historic factions, some groups are subversive and active, others are progressive and committed to peace building, and some are just ordinary criminals at this stage. There are several implications because the reality on the ground is that we have a per percentage of individuals connected to paramilitary groups who cannot easily or safely leave their card carrying status. They might want, um, they might want to, but exiting presents really real difficulties. 
um, there are social consequences of leaving. Um, there's a disloyalty uh, and there's often a requirement to leave the community completely. In hindsight, I think we might have missed the boat on some of this thinking because reintegration has long been an important part of the UN recognised forms of DDR. But the nature of the conflict here meant we didn't fully participate in that as a process. Um, and as paramilitary structures prevail both old and new, it's clear that no route out will keep us moving in a process with no obvious conclusion. I suppose we're still talking about, in the language of paramilitaries, 20 years out of a, after a peace process. My question back to the panel would be, how can we be an island of peace when we continue to be stuck inside these recurring and persistent conflict patterns? I do think there's an opportunity here, however, and I suppose it connects to John's point, which is an opportunity to imagine what it might take to create the collective civic courage to say that a community living with high status criminals as a status quo is not how we choose to live. To speak back to our publicly elected officials and demand effective governments, uh, a government for the people and one that commits to facing into the wisdom and unfinished work embedded in our peace agreement. A further opportunity is to build a sense of purpose in the peace process once more. It's been a long time, there's a bit of tiredness. International and national researchers pointed out to us that the peace process here led to the protection of key controversial rituals such as parades, protests, demonstrations, yet paid little heed to the comm commemoration of the victims, the loss, the lament, or even the peace builders who paid such a high price for an agreement. At some level, we ritually enshrine difference, um, but fail to find the sacred in the peace. I'm not naive, and this is clearly a controversial peace process, but surely it's an improvement on what went before. Is there a way in which the collective civic courage, so back to that radical citizenship, I think, um, of our communities as nations, islands, or, or an island or islands, could find a way to acknowledge and ritualize the potential for peace? Could we work to inspire and engage young people in our community in whom the future rests with rituals that commemorate the building of peace. I believe we have a duty as an island of peace with ourselves and others to find a way to integrate our citizens, both new and old, to seek ways to vision our future together and to build a community where peace is a given and no longer a question mark. Thanks. Thanks very much, Shona, again, for um, sharing those insights based on research done by Corey Mila, uh, and also, of course, the lengthy experience of Corey Mila uh, working on peacemaking in, in Northern Ireland um, and identifying those nine significant themes. You might even just type them into the chat box and possibly put the link to your website as well if people want to pursue those. Um, so thanks again for, for, the, for those insights. So uh, David, um, over to you uh, to discuss overcoming challenges to Ireland as an island of peace. Thanks very much. Um, so I suppose what I was saying before that is uh, it's hard to export the Northern Ireland peace process uh, or repeat it elsewhere uh, or even pick out lessons. But at the same time, we can't uh, we can't leave it there because it would be a pretty unhealthy attitude for someone in a conflict to think that they shouldn't or couldn't learn anything from anywhere else. The idea that your society's problems are unique and uniquely bad is a characteristic of intractable conflict and is obviously a major ob obstacle to resolving it. So regardless of whether Ireland or anywhere else is seen as a place synonymous with peace, other cases are always worth exploring. But I think that exploration shouldn't be framed as a search for lessons, for direction or guidance, but a more open-ended journey into the rich detail of another place. This might bring about a change in how people see their own conflict and what may be possible. For example, it can be inspiring for politicians to hear from leaders in another conflict of their sacrifices, failings, or achievements. It can be comforting for people who have suffered violence to share with those who have suffered violence in another place. And it can be empowering for civil society groups who work for peace in one context to meet people doing a comparable job in another setting. 
ultimately what the case of Northern Ireland does is that it illustrates a peace process at an advanced stage with all its opportunities, setbacks and challenges. When I did some research on why policymakers from other conflicts wanted to visit Northern Ireland, one of the things that people said was that they find that the imperfections and failings of the peace process were the most useful things to see. Those flaws showed that any peace process is going to be messy and therefore they make a peace process seem more doable, less like a, a superhuman thing. So it wasn't about picking up lessons, but getting a sense of what a peace process is and a new sense of perspective. One of the most famous books with which compares Northern Ireland with other conflicts is Frank Wright's Northern Ireland, a Comparative Analysis, published in 1987. Now, it's a pretty complex book, but at the start, he makes a very simple point. And it's not about lessons or theories, but it's about what we're saying here about the human encounter between people from different conflict affected places. And he was talking about meeting groups from other places who come to Northern Ireland. And he said, quote, that discussions about Northern Ireland seem to strike home when they take root also in their experience, that is the visitor's experience. Then all of us begin to discover more about ourselves. This also reminds us that people in Northern Ireland need to get out more, so to speak. They can benefit from encountering other cases. And it's worth remembering that by all accounts, visits to South Africa in the 1990s by political leaders here did make a big impact and energized the search for accommodation in Northern Ireland. So to go back to the image of Ireland as an island of peace, certainly in terms of the peace process, there is some truth to it, but I don't think we really need that image to recognize that people in conflict affected places can gain from studying and exchanging and interacting with other cases, wherever they may be, not in the hope of lessons, but in the hope of a new perspective. But perhaps we shouldn't be too hard on this idealized image of the Northern Ireland peace process. Human beings naturally idealize other places. We like to make comparisons and we like to think that other societies are getting things right because it gives us hope that we may someday be going in the same direction. So perhaps in a world of conflict, we need some exemplars, we need some success stories, even if they're partly mythical and hard to repeat elsewhere. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, David, for those suggestions of, around how um, comparisons between peace processes can in fact be beneficial, but also the need to pay attention to context and lived experience as part of those comparisons. So thanks for that. Um, and now Lisa, uh, it's your opportunity um, to Thank you. Uh, comment on overcoming challenges. Thank you. There's one thing that I didn't say in the first round, which is not uh, a challenge to be overcome, but which is an appreciation of Ireland at an international level. Ireland supported our campaign for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons as one of only three countries in the European Union. It was heroic, its behavior, Ir Irish behavior was heroic. I am then uh, absolutely scandalized to read a note by Joe Murray in, uh, in the chat about uh, the, anyway, you, you can all see it there, uh, something I completely didn't know anything about. But I thought I, overcoming the challenges in my experience elsewhere um, is always or almost always to do with memory uh, and to do with how you, you fail so frequently to construct a shared memory across the border, across the conflicts, a memory that is uh, shared amongst all those who were part of the conflict. And uh, that is absolutely necessary. One, one little anecdote from Kosovo. After the end of the, the NATO bombing, when the 
Albanian, uh, Kosovo Albanian refugees started coming back into the country from Albania, from Montenegro, where they, Macedonia, where they had fled, uh, they, there was an episode of violence. There were several of them, but there was one particularly nasty episode of violence against the Serb population that had stayed. These were 14 Serb peasants who were murdered in their fields as they gathered their wheat, as they harvested their wheat in uh, September, I think it was, I mean, in, in 99. And I was very friendly at that moment with a whole family of, of Albanian Kosovars who we had helped come back home from Montenegro where they had been refugees. And my close friend there, Angelina, she said to me, oh, how horrible this murder of these 14 peasants harvesting their wheat in the field. How, how absolutely terrible I am distraught that we could have done something like that. The next day, she came back to me and she said, I, I've learned what happened in that field. Of course, the Serbs, you know how warmongering they always are. They were fighting amongst themselves as to whether to stay in Kosovo or to leave. And so they just killed each other. And I said, Angelina, you don't really believe that story, do you? And her face went completely blank. And she said, yes, of course I do. And this was a close friend of mine. And so I witnessed how you can rewrite and uh, manipulate history. And this will go down into the memory of the Kosovo Albanians that they were not, none of them were responsible for the murder of these 14 Serb farmers. So that's why memory is so important. That's what happened. That's what was manipulated cleverly enough to give rise to all the Yugoslav wars, really, because they all harked back onto what had been happening in, uh, in World War II. So I really believe that this is something that is so important. And the other thing is something that's already been mentioned, is the important role that we've got to give to good stories as well as bad stories. Righteous behavior, not, not heroics, but just people remaining human under inhuman circumstances. These are things that together we've got to talk about and we've got to tell each other about and we've got to transmit, retransmit these memories. And together, once we can manage to have shared memories, we will be able to, to write a shared history or to have a shared history, which is the only way to move forward with a positive peace in a community. Uh, we all have to agree on certain things that happened, uh, otherwise we're doomed. And of course the victims should be our witnesses of history, not the soldiers, the warriors. I've had enough of monuments to soldiers and uh, men on horseback who fought for our country. I'd like to see the people who died in Auschwitz or the people who died in Srebrenica or the people who died uh, in the Falls area or wherever it is in, in, in your part of Northern Ireland as well, because those are the ones who should be our heroes if we want to avoid getting into wars again. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lisa. Uh, again, for those insights and emphasizing the importance of memory in peacemaking, whether we need a shared history or at least the possibility to share our histories is perhaps up for discussion. Um, but nonetheless, that's, that's really an important insight, I think, in terms of um, the requirements of sustainable peacemaking. So just to thank um, all our presenters, all five presenters for, uh, I think you will agree, some very rich um, presentations with lots of points to think about, lots of insights, um, combining uh, insights from the island of Ireland in terms of the peace process here, challenges to 
uh, Irish foreign policy, the challenges posed to uh, both parts of Ireland by the militarization of international relations, um, and then linking that to uh, issues in peacemaking at the international level, referring to uh, Ireland's role in the UN, for instance. So thanks to our panel for some very rich uh, presentations and insights, um, which will give us lots to think about in the days and weeks ahead, I'm sure. Now, Jin, um, I think, uh, was going to identify some of the points or questions from the, uh, the chat box, um, which I can then direct to members of the panel. We have about 20 minutes left, so we might have time for one or even two rounds of responses from the panel to these questions. So, okay. Jin, do you want to identify those or will yep. I begin yep. that? Okay. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you all to the uh, panel members for your excellent insight. I will just um, um, summarize some of the comments and questions uh, arising from the chat box. So um, the first question would be the role of Ireland at the Security Council, now that Ireland is on the Security Council, uh, and then what would be the role of Ireland for peace and justice? Uh, internationally, uh, particularly when you see the division uh, at the Security Council between P2 and P3 and then other members of the Security Council. And what could be the role at, uh, at this moment for Ireland? And then the second question would be then, um, if in, uh, the harmony and friendships are the keywords in the Irish constitution, how can we foster this spirit on the island of Ireland? And, in, and then in relation to that, that the panel members covered uh, some already, but there are diverse groups in Northern Ireland and Ireland and in the UK. And how could we uh, promote work of reconciliation um, to make uh, a progress in a, uh, for a new island and then to support one another without uh, scapegoating the other and encourage each other for their good work. Um, so um, we could start from here. Thanks, Jin, for um, uh, identifying those questions and comments. I see two sets there, so I might direct them separately to members of the panel in priority. One question or set of questions focuses on the international dimension, uh, particularly Ireland's role in the UN and capacity for peacemaking at that level. And then the second question was more focused on the work of reconciliation and peacemaking within the island of Ireland. So maybe I'll start with the first question, the international dimension, um, focusing first on Lisa, John, and Noel, um, and then if Shona and David want to come in um, on that, they can. And then we'll look at the the um, the more domestic context after that. So maybe in reverse order, Lisa, do you want to comment on the international dimension and particularly Ireland's role in the in the UN? Thanks. Now, just on the what I began to say earlier on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, where Ireland played uh, an enormous role, a very important role for, for several years. Uh, in fact, the process of uh, writing, the, the agreeing on the text of that treaty was a process that was uh, promoted from below the civil society, basically. Um, but with a few very friendly countries, states uh, of which Ireland was one. And uh, we now need more help uh, though from Ireland and Austria especially to convince uh, what we call NATO complicit countries or nuclear weapon complicit countries uh, like Italy where I live and uh, Belgium and the Netherlands and Germany that host US nuclear weapons to um, listen to their people, to their citizens, 
uh, we know that the citizens in our countries are overwhelmingly in favor of getting rid of those nuclear weapons, overwhelmingly in favor of uh, joining the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, so perhaps Ireland as a leader can show us the way, can help us out. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, John, do you want to say something on Ireland's contribution via the, the UN? Um. Yeah, it's very difficult uh, to bring up issues like Shannon. And of course, whatever about UN authorization for Shannon, if it was there for a while, how do we know where the planes were going? How do we know what was being carried? Because we never searched them. So we don't want to know what's been happening at Shannon, whether occasionally the UN mandated it or not. Going back to uh, the Security Council, uh, why would I want to deny all the wonderful work? Why would I want to deny a peace process and a Belfast Good Friday Agreement, uh, uh, which are wonderful and great achievements? But then we see Raytheon and Spirit Drone, Raytheon coming in, gone now, Spirit Drone uh, coming. How can we not relate the peace process to what we do at the Security Council? Today, the British flag is being taken down in Afghanistan after 20 years of a disastrous war. And Ireland was on the Security Council when that war was being planned. Now, I'm sure Ireland didn't privately sit on their hands, but I have read every single resolution passed by the Security Council in the aftermath of 9-11 and on the way to the Afghan war. There isn't a shred in the public statements when Ireland was there of how do you understand where violence comes from? How do you go for a police action rather than a military onslaught? So I'd love to see us speaking up. I'd love to see us bringing the focus back to the UN. There's no point saying we're involved in UN mandated peacekeeping when the UN can't direct its own peacekeeping. And that's what I'd like us to see. And rather than to be quite honest, rather than looking for a seat on the Security Council, a country like Ireland could have had such an impact if it said, we're staying in the General Assembly and we demand reform of the Security Council and of the uh, veto of the permanent powers. I'm not saying that can be done easily, but you know, I have huge regard for all the great work. I'm heartbroken that so many of the things we've drifted into being involved in have, under, have threatened to undermine it and certainly are in contrast with it. Um, and I wish that that was our attitude to the UN, rather than going along with PESCO and passing treaties in the European Union, which pay respect to the principles of the United Nations. As Noel said, the United Nations is a major authority I believe it's been undermined and eroded by NATO. And I think that our implicit working with NATO, uh, rather than openly saying we're prepared to make modern warfare, is not compatible with the rest of the good work that Shona and other people and David have been talking about on this island. I think that's tragic. Sorry to be the ghost at the feast, but I will name Shannon and we need to stop that kind of thing. Oh, thanks very much, John. Um, and uh, yes, some important um, reminders there in terms of the real nature of uh, Irish foreign policy and um, uh, on some of these issues. Uh, no, um, some comments on Ireland's role at the UN, and then I'll perhaps bring in David and Shona, um, who can comment on the the more uh, the, the second set of questions. I'll start with the wise words of Kofi Annan in 2000, the former Secretary General of the UN. He said, in addition to the responsibilities that each state bears towards its own people, states are collectively the custodians of our common life on this planet. Now, the closest thing to some sort of coordinating body for our common life on the planet at a political level is the Security Council. 
It's a weak instrument in many ways, but it's the best we have. It's, I sat on the Security Council for two years, 1981 and 82, as the Irish representative. I know how difficult it was at the time, and it still is very difficult because five members, five permanent members, each have a veto. So it's like negotiating something, a poker game with people with guns under the table they can pull out and disrupt the game at any stage. It's very, very difficult and you have to be cautious and careful and handle it wisely what you're doing. Now, and selectively at times, there's no other way to make it work. Now, Ireland and Norway are particularly close in this and coordinate together. The Security Council today is far, far more busy than it was in my time, which was the height of the Cold War. There are all sorts of committees and other actions that don't get much attention. I'll just say that, um, for instance, Ireland at this term in the Security Council is facilitator of the resolution on the Iran nuclear deal, trying to mediate between the five permanent members and the other elected members, and generally to promote the resumption of the Iran nuclear deal. Secondly, we're co-chair of the informal expert group on women, peace and security, along with Mexico. And thirdly, we're co-chair, that is to say our representative is the co-chair of the informal expert group on climate and security. There's a great deal going on that doesn't get much attention, but it has to be done selectively. You can't be all over the place. I attended the UN as a delegate in the 1960s when Ireland was not involved in the EU and not on the Security Council. And many good things were said and done by Frank Aiken, our minister at the time. But I also have to say that that was declarations by a small country of what should be done. It's much more difficult and much more important in many ways to get into this system and try to make it work bad and weak as it is. And I think that's what we're trying to do in the Security Council. Now, there was another question. I didn't quite get the question about uh, North South in, in Ireland. I'm not quite sure what the, the question was. Ian, could you remind me of that? Well, I might um, let... You want to pass on to someone else at this stage? Yeah, and if there's time, then maybe I'll come back to you on that one, Noel. But the question, I think, Jim can correct me, um, was really around the requirements of work towards reconciliation um, in a, a new Ireland. Um, uh, yeah, so kind of building on some of the comments that Shona and David in particular um, made. I think there was a reference to the Dalai Lama on love and compassion as well as a basis for reconciliation. Perhaps I could just say two or three sentences on that. Uh, yeah. I think the other speakers here have been very impressive and I'm interested in the different steps that they're taking towards reconciliation. I have spoken perhaps at a larger political level, which is probably a professional deformation because I spent much of my life uh, working as a diplomat, trying to deal in my way as an official with the issues in relation to Northern Ireland. So in addition to the governmental level, which is very important, I think the work of others, Kari Mila and uh, Glenn Cree and the other speakers who have spoken here today is terribly important. And I want to emphasize that at the human level as distinct from the political level, but I think both have to go together and uh, one prepares the way for the other. Thanks, Noel. And that does touch on Shona's theme that Lisa picked up on. I think of the need for multiple levels of engagement um, as part of that process of reconciliation. David, do you want to say something briefly on that very broad topic? I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question as to whether we have reconciliation in Northern Ireland and how much of it we have and how do we identify it. Um, I mean, I think Northern Ireland is still a very peaceful place com compared to many um, parts of the world. So we can get, I think, overly down in the dumps about the state of things here. Um, I think the recent spate of violence at Easter time involved a pretty small number of people and was probably blown out of all proportion, not to, not to sort of underplay the problems, but um, 
Uh, nevertheless, I think we have come a long way. I think reconciliation might be happening, but it's so kind of under the radar and so maybe gradual that we can't um, quite see it a lot of the time, but there's a huge amount of good work going on at grassroots level, uh, you know, which has nothing to do with Brexit or the problems in the DUP or the calls for the border poll. Um, but uh, good stuff going on that's, uh, you know, a long distance um, away from that. We might be seeing some fruits of that in some of the changing um, electoral results over the last five to 10 years, where we do have a swelling of the kind of middle ground to some extent. Uh, and whether you like the middle ground or not, I still think that's a good thing in terms of moderating the overall um, sort of uh, picture. Um, so, uh, so yeah, but I think, I mean, I probably possibly again, as somebody who studies politics, I always blame the politicians or at least, or, or, or perhaps think the politicians are the solution uh, because I think politicians are, are able to do things like that. They can stop saying provocative things just like that. Um, uh, they can they can say positive things, you know, immediately in a way that sort of grassroots work sort of takes a lot of time and that kind of relationship um, building. But again, the politicians, um, certain among them, uh, still see a benefit to uh, playing to the gallery and, and whipping up the old sort of narratives. Um, but but nevertheless, I still think, you know, the overall trajectory of the last 20 to 30 years is is hugely positive. OK, thanks. David, for those uh, thoughts. Um, so shown us some final uh, thoughts or insights on this big question of the requirements of reconciliation in <laughs> Reconciliation is my favorite thing, so I'm delighted. Uh, we, uh, I suppose one of um, the thing that most strikes me is actually David's um, story about meeting the Kurdish gentleman at the, was it the car wash, David? <laughs> so there's something for me about exposure uh, in terms of harmony and friendship, which I think the, the initial question was about. There's something about exposure and creating spaces in which um, in a sort of unexpectedly unspacious world, we tend to work within echo chambers where we hear exactly what we want to hear. We talk to people who will give us the information that we think we want to know. Um, but there's something for me about creating unexpected opportunities, unexpected gatherings. And I think that creates unexpected outcomes. Um, and I think it's about meeting with those who are, who are not just the same as us and looking for those opportunities, because we know that when we build relationships, new patterns of trust can develop. And so that for me continues to be a, a very big focus of our work to try and bring people together from different backgrounds. And that goes for all kind of parts of division within our community. Um, we did a project recently where we talked to uh, one of the actions, it was a, an action based project, one of the actions was to go around to your neighbour um, and, uh, you know, have, have a chat with them and risk not getting a reply, because we have to be courageous in this stuff. Harmony and friendship doesn't happen by accident. We have to be courageous. And I think there's a collective civic response. Um, which will help progress that reconciliation. And I think that that is ongoing. And I think David's right to say there is this for sure improvements within our community. Um, and there is always work to be done in terms of building right relationship with one another. And I think that's um, probably the, the journey to an island of peace. Okay, thanks very much, Shona, for those um, positive and encouraging words about um, uh, some of the requirements for uh, reconciliation, not just in Northern Ireland, but to go back to the comparative aspect, perhaps in other uh, conflict contexts as well. So I think that really brings um, our time almost to an end. Um, I would like to thank our five panelists for their excellent presentations in two intense rounds of um, uh, conversation and discussion, and also for responding so generously to the questions and comments of the participants. Uh, I think it's been a very rich discussion, lots of diversity, different views and perspectives, but also covering many different dimensions of what it might mean for Ireland to be an island of peace from uh, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, um, to the international context and the UN 
peace activism on the ground, but also higher level um, political engagement as well. So thanks again to Noel Dorr, John McGuire, uh, Shona Bell, David Mitchell, and Lisa Clark for taking the time to participate. Before we go, uh, Jin wants to announce the next in this wonderful series of ISE at 50 webinars. So over to you, Jin. Thank you so much, Ian. So next webinar will be on the 7th of October to, um, this year, at uh, the same time at five. The theme of the webinar will be gender and peace building on a shared island. The five uh, panel members are Brona Hines uh, from Democracy. Uh, she's a co-founder of a, uh, the Northern Irish uh, Women's Coalition and Georgia Knapp um, from DFA, Irish uh, Secretariat in Belfast. Uh, Salome Bugua uh, from uh, Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, and Niall uh, Dumartin uh, from Ulster University, and Catherine Meyer from Christ Church Sandy Mount. Uh, the panel will be chaired by Gillian Wiley uh, from Peace Studies School of Religion, Trinity College Dublin. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jin. So we look forward to seeing you in the autumn at the next webinar. And thanks to all of you who joined us this evening. Um, and again, once more, thanks to all of our uh, panelists and presenters. And in particular, thanks, of course, to Jin for doing such an excellent job organizing this webinar. So um, thanks, everyone. And uh, enjoy your summers um, and look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. <laughs>